Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Montana State University Library's Trout and Salmonid Lecture Series. <clears throat> My name is Kenny Arlich. I'm the Dean of the Library. Thanks for coming tonight, and thanks to our host, the Museum of the Rockies. I found an article today by Melinda Harrison that was published in the 2009 edition of Mountains and Mines. It was titled, MSU is Trout U, and it described a number of centers and programs at or near Montana State University that justify the moniker of Trout U. Among these were the Montana Cooperative Fisheries Research Unit in MSU's Ecology Department, the Montana Water Center, the Bozeman Fish Technology Center of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Big Sky Institute, and the Northern Rocky Mountain Science Center of the U.S. Geological Survey. And I would add one that's new as of 2011, the Institute on the Ecosystems. But topping the list in the article is the Bud Lilly Trout and Salmonid Initiative. Quote, the world's most dynamic collection of books and manuscripts devoted to trout and salmon is located in MSU's Rennie Library. Thanks to the vision and initiative of Bud Lilly and former Dean of the Library, Bruce Morton, the trout and salmon collection has become a gem for fish researchers and fishermen everywhere. It documents our appreciation for a big part of our natural environment and for everything that fish mean to our culture. It documents what once was, what is now, and with proper care, this collection will communicate our world to the future. Tonight we are honored to have Nathaniel Reed speak to us. That introduction I will leave to Jim Thule, reference librarian and primary champion of the Trout and Salmon Collection. Good evening. It is my honor to introduce Mr. Nathaniel Reed as MSU Library's Trout and Salmonid 2013 guest lecturer. Mr. Reed has a long and distinguished career and is one of the leading conservationists of our era. His impact on the environmental protections we enjoy today cannot be underestimated. While serving as Assistant Secretary uh, of the Environmental, I'm sorry, while serving as Assistant Secretary of the Interior for, the, the Interior for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks in the Nixon and Ford Administration, he created quite possibly the finest team ever assembled to advise the White House on environmental matters. Legislation like the Endangered Species Act and the Clean Water Act are direct results of his efforts. In addition, he is a lifelong fly fisher and a wonderful storyteller. He mentioned yesterday that his mother swears he came out of the womb with a fly rod in one hand. <laughs> On that note, I am pleased and honored to introduce Mr. Nathaniel Reed. Good evening. I'm actually delighted to be here and, and to see some old friends, uh, Dean, Bruce, you started something, got the ball rolling, that is something very, very special in the world of libraries. And Jim, thank you for taking such wonderful care of me. I need it at all times at my age. <laughs> my father loved the West. And as each of his sons got to be, after the war, got to be 12, 13, 14 years of age, he took them on individual trips, some to see where his grandfather, his father, our grandfather, had staked out claims in Cripple Creek and sold the great mine to the Anglo Company, which gave him a grub stake that lasted him the rest of his life, uh, and his son's lives as well, <laughs> and even his, some of his grandsons. Uh, I got the trip of the century because he invited me to tour Yellowstone. And we started in Livingston, where I met uh, Dan Bailey, and I'll never forget looking at those walls of those carved giant trout, you know, at the age of 14, size mattered. <laughs> 
I had gotten slightly over the edge of numbers. Besides, oh my, the size of those fish were really something. Well, I was enormously impressed by that shot. But we continued on into the park, and uh, we went down, we went up to West Yellowstone, where Mr. Martinez owned the, the famous tackle shop at that time, before Bud Lilly bought it from him, Don Martinez, and made it into one of the great fly shops in the world. Um, along the way, Father invited me to be guided by some really great young guys who uh, enormously contributed to my ability to cast a fly rod. And on top of that, of course, the salesman in Bud Lilly's shop, you know, and uh, Mel Martinez's shop, and uh, uh, the shop in Livingston, and above all, Bob Carmichael's shop in Moose, they made sure that I was completely out, re-outfitted with every bit of clothing that money could buy. <laughs> My father was extremely generous to go along with this. I enjoyed Bob Carmichael so much, despite his problems with alcohol, and of course he had a breathing problem from being gassed in the First World War. But kicking around his shop as a teenager, he finally asked me if I'd like to work uh, three or four days a week for, for minimum pay, I might add, uh, to gain an experience in the real world. He didn't think I lived in the real world, and he was right. Uh, but one of the great scenes every, every August would be uh, a couple of other attractive young men who were assistants, uh, we would be just fooling around the shop. And suddenly a Cadillac with Texas license plates would pull into the Carmichael Moose Fishing Tackle Shop. And like a rocket, Bob was out of his chair. All hands on board! The Texans are here! And in would walk two unsuspecting Texans saying, Hey, we hear that this uh, Trout fishing is quite something. We'd sure like to take a crack at it. Well, if they got out of there for less than a thousand dollars, we'd fail. <laughs> there was nothing that we didn't sell. Right? They had to have the finest. They probably had five dozen dry flies tied by Roy Donnelly. They had to have nets. They had to have waders. Well, we didn't sell them waders. We sold them boots because. We were scared to death that they'd drown. Uh, the fly rods were the finest, the reels were hardies, the lines were silk. The, the uh, leaders were silk gut, believe it or not, with the with little, little round aluminum boxes that you put, them, you put the silk worm leaders in and kept them wet so that they, didn't, they weren't stiff in the morning. Uh, clippers, uh, creels, uh, hats, uh, bandanas, you name it, we sold it to them. And after we got them underway, we'd always have a couple of guys go with them and get them, you, you know, it's not like you can just pick up a fly rod and begin to cast. You'll flail, obviously. But the, prop, the, the, the point I want to make about these three shops and the influence they had, not only inside the fishing inside Yellowstone National Park, that was in those days non parallel, is the impact that they made on the surrounding countryside, which was still dominated by worms and horrible uh, salmon eggs and a vast variety of spoons and flatfish and spinners. Fly fishing was what they lived for what they believed in it, what they, this was, the, this was the beginning of a change, a change that has manifested itself now into one of the biggest uh, bonanzas as rod companies, reel companies, line companies, uh, every conceivable piece of equipment or catalogs that must cost a freaking fortune to produce. Page after page of fascinating things, most of which you do not need, but nevertheless are attractively shown. I was very 
fortunate and unfortunate at the same time of being the one Reed brother. I guess I was quiet, gentle. Uh, uh, my two eldest and two younger were, were, were much more difficult. Uh, I was sent to live with my grandmother Reed in Denver uh, every August. And uh, the highlight of the August trips were that on Friday afternoon, I was free from official duties. Official duties being that she had something to do every day as one of the great philanthropists in Denver. And her chauffeur, Louis Wecker, had saved gas all during the week, and we headed out uh, to uh, nearby ranches uh, where we put up, and uh, uh, I couldn't cast very well, but I caught my first trout with him. And uh, the excitement of fishing western rivers just grew on me. I must admit, reading the uh, daily newspaper, Rocky Mountain News, I was fascinated by the pictures of strings of dead trout. And there was a store in downtown Denver that I really insisted that my grandmother allow us to stop there on the way back to luncheon, where they had a big freezer box outside the store where the three or four biggest trout caught the previous weekend or week were displayed. And I would look at these absolute monsters with my eyes popping out. Uh, this is long before anybody considered the ethics of sport fishing. It was you caught fish to eat and you didn't put them back. Uh, the more fish that you caught, the greater angler you were considered to be. More was better than fewer. Catch and release had never been heard of, would probably have been considered heretical. A new generation of fly fishermen came along beginning in the, in the 60s. And the Western trout fishing really revolves around the abundance of wild trout. And the three men who promoted the sport of fly fishing, Dan Bailey, Bob Carmichael, and the only one and only Bud Lilly. I'm going to conclude my remarks about the possible threats to wonderful, the wonderful world of wild trout later in my remarks. First, uh, my wife insisted that I tell you about my third day as Assistant Secretary of Interior. I uh, <coughs> had let go all the previous staff on day two. Uh, they were the sons of major campaign con contributors. They were all crack shots. And, pretty good fishermen. They didn't know how to spell the word environment. And I had told the president that I was cleaning shop and uh, I had to, I wanted to bring in the professionals from the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Park Service until I could recruit my own staff. Um, the first meeting with Nixon, I guess, is worth recounting. He looked across the desk in the Oval Office and said, you're quite famous in Florida, aren't you? I said, well, I'm either famous or infamous, depending upon which side of the coin you want to look at my record. He said, I know all about you. That's why I have to appoint Assistant Secretary. Now, I'm going to tell you something, Reed. I really don't give a damn about any environmental issue. All I want is a good record. And John Erlkman is my aide to see that I get a good record. And uh, you are to be in close contact with him. He was a former land use planning lawyer from Seattle, and he has a very strong environmental ethic. And he will be your contact in the White House. 
Now, your secretary, Rogers Morton, is an Easterner from Maryland. He doesn't know a damn thing except about waterfowl and striped bass, but he's a jolly fellow who the Congress likes, and you are going to like very much. I said, I've known him for years, Mr. President. I'm crazy about him, and you're wrong. He's, he's, a, very no he's a very knowledgeable and wise man when it comes to animal management and the management of the national park system. Well, tell me what your first three priorities are going to be. I said, Mr. President, I'm going to form a team of experts and have an executive order written banning the use of 1080 in the western states forever. And that I will have an accompany EIS that will withstand any legal challenge that the wool growers put up. There was a pause and he said, you know, I understand that it's a terrible poison. My wife has told me on numerous occasions that the coyote dies very slowly. And I said, it's not only the coyote, Mr. Mr. President, it's bears and wolverines and bobcats, it's anything that touches one of these baits loaded with 1080. It's a terrible chemical. It should never have been invented, and now it should be banned, and you're the man to do it. Well, he said, oh, I don't have that many friends among the wool growers. The hell will it ban? <laughs> he said, what's the second objective? I said, I will have another team working that will bring in, it'll take a little bit longer, uh, a, a ban order plus a complete environmental impact statement banning DDT from any use in the United States. Oh, he said, that won't please John Olin very much. He's my biggest campaign supporter, and he makes DDT. And he leaned back in the chair, and he said, the more I think about it, the more I like it. He calls every day telling me how I should run the presidency. Screw it. <laughs> Well now, what next, Mr. Reed and Nathaniel Davis, he said. I said, well, I'm going to put a team together to select the very, very best lands in Alaska. We're allowed to pick 85 to 88, maybe 90 a million acres of land for permanent possession of the National Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Mr. President, this is a chance of a lifetime to emulate Teddy Roosevelt. This is the last chance that huge, a huge piece of federal land, Alaska, can be subdivided into national parks and national wildlife refuges and additions to the national forest, which is a joke. Um, and he said, that will take time. Uh, that will uh, tie up Alaska, you know that. May tie up some important minerals and may tie up some more oil. Uh, but, second only to Teddy Roosevelt, <laughs> I rather like that idea. Well, their order was on Jerry Ford's side desk the day of the transfer of power to President James Earl Carter. And the reason President Ford didn't sign the withdrawal is that Donald Rumsfeld, who was chief of staff, told him it was not presidential authority, but it was the authority of the Congress. And of course, all the withdrawal order did was to give time for the Congress to make the difficult decisions. And all I can tell you is I had a group of young men working in an office adjacent to mine seven days a week for four and a half years with the greatest experts on Alaska, not only in the federal government, but from Alaska, who would smuggle themselves in. From the Sierra Club, where Dr. Weyburn was an acknowledged expert on the Alaska ecosystems. But we had everybody in, who was really knowledgeable of fish, wildlife, scenic values, to come up with a master plan. And when Cecil Andrews became, when Jimmy Carter became president, Cecil Andrews became Secretary, he asked me to come back and work for him for two months for nothing. Didn't even get my room paid for. And uh, he said, I love Cecil. He said, 
It's a great plan. Uh, the problem is, it's got to be Jimmy Carter and my plan. And so, you've got to give me some names of experts, because I've got to add about 8 million more acres to the withdrawal. And with that, I can then say it's ours. I said, fine, we, you know, let's just get it done, Cecil. And so we pulled together some of the re retiring members of the expert team, and we added a million here, a half a million there, 250 there, and, uh, and the president signed the withdrawal order. And to show you the incredible change in the American uh, system of government, 30% of the sponsors in the Senate were Republicans. Now, I don't mean that they were Rocky Mountain Republicans, but they were from Maine to Connecticut to Delaware, Maryland. Uh, John Shakey of Rhode Island was the leader, and we passed this monumental act the likes of which will never be seen again. I always kid Cecil, he never mentions that all the work was done for him ahead of time, but that's all right. <laughs> At a certain age, you don't remember your successes, you only remember your failures. Um, as I was leaving the president's office, he said, I understand you made some kind of a deal with Rogers Morton and John Ehrlichman that you could pick your own staff. And I said, yes, that is the deal. I really didn't come to Washington to go on the cocktail circuit. I've got three young children. I'm a workaholic, and I want to pick a staff with widespread expertise, unlike anything at Interior or many of the other federal agencies have ever seen. And I can do it, Mr. President. I can, be, I, I can send out the word and I can interview, if, even if it takes 12, 14 hour days, I can be fully staffed in 30 days. There was a sort of a low groan. And he said, John, I'll bet he picks all Democrats. <laughs> Anyway, I persevered and by the addition of two great young men, experienced in government, loyal, became my deputies, and then we added the very, very best. I didn't want a big staff. I was allowed a big staff. I didn't want one. I wanted a staff that worked so hard that they never fought over who got that issue. And uh, it worked. Right away, quick, we were confronted with a whole series of adventures that were going on in the administration quietly. And uh, I had to get up to speed in a hurry. These included the Alaska Land Act, the Clean Water Act, the beginnings of writing clearly the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Air Act, numerous regulations on the discharge of sewage and, and uh, industrial waste into the Great Lakes. Just think on sewage alone. All sewage in Florida, from Palm Beach to the Keys, and from Tampa to Naples, ran raw into the sea every day. Eight to ten billion gallons. The health department maintained that dilution was the cure for pollution. <laughs> the amazing thing about Nixon is that he decided that he really wanted to get ahead on the sewage program so that despite the continuing war in Vietnam, he came up with a program through John Erdman and Russell Train that offered every town and every county and every state 90% of the money needed to build new, highly, uh, brilliantly designed sewage treatment plants. And the towns and cities and counties 
had only five years to begin to work and complete, or the federal funds would dry up. And so it, uh, uh, it was a madhouse, and, but it was one of the most exciting periods for sewage control in our nation's history. Can you imagine that in the Great Lakes, Chicago was a, a culprit too into Lake Michigan. It, you can't believe the gallonage of raw sewage that was being discharged. San Francisco Bay, you name it, Los Angeles Bay, you name it, everywhere in this country. We had failed ourselves, our children, by releasing massive amounts of raw sewage that obviously had every kind of a creepy bug in it that you could. I often used to say out loud, which we got, always got good press, but got hateful letters. Everybody would join in the effort if they all of a sudden came down with red spots. <laughs> Not a popular, not a popular <laughs> statement. Um, I had a great governor, and uh, he threatened all the communities that didn't want to play with me. Malfeasance, misfeasance, nonfeasance, and uh, slowly but surely, we caught up in Florida. Well, I had the most extraordinary experience. Three days in office. I had known Ambassador Dolbrinin of the Soviet Union for many years because he came to Jupiter Island as a guest of senior moment uh, of a great, great man who I will come up with, Abel Harriman. And he was a keen, nutty bird. He had one of the greatest life lists of birds you ever laid eyes on. And I took him out in my skiff and showed him at least five birds on the Indian River that he did not have. And then I took him to Lake Okeechobee where he picked up probably 12 birds that he didn't have, including the Everglades kite. And then another year I took him into the Everglades which was, you know, on an airboat. He was absolutely totally dumbfounded. I might add, his security officer was sure that they were going to be killed out in the middle of the Everglades. I was very nervous and fingered his Glock or whatever it was <laughs> most of the time. I got a call from the, from the, uh, from the ambassador at 5.45 in the afternoon asking me if I wouldn't mind stopping by the embassy at 6.15 the same evening. My wife had taken a suite at the old Jefferson Hotel, a moldy hotel at that time, now fancy as can be. I wanted to stay at the Hay Adams and she vetoed that. And uh, it was nearly across the street. I drove my, drove my own car up to the front of the embassy. A vast mansion on Connecticut Avenue. And the two large goons were there holding a parking place open. I pulled in. I was escorted to the front door, which opened magically with a very handsomely dressed butler who said, Secretary Reed, the ambassador is looking forward to seeing you. I walked in, it was covered. It, it had a ceiling that was twice as high as this, covered with pewter <coughs> shooting arrows and angels. And uh, it had a golden uh, staircase going up curving up to an upper level where the ambassador stood saying, Nathaniel, how wonderful to see you. Our congratulations on being appointed and confirmed. Come on upstairs. I could hardly walk upstairs. I couldn't have. I said, Mr. Ambassador, what in the holy hell is this building? He said, oh, it's Mr. Pullman's estate. The railroad car man, you know. I said, well, there had to be some explanation like that. I said, but don't you feel a little bit embarrassed of being, you know, from the Soviet Union? Shouldn't you be living in slightly meaner quarters? Hell no! I haven't given my life to the government without living in marvelous quarters such as this. He said, come on in. In the library, we're going to have a glass of vodka. You, you, you never go anywhere in Russia without having a glass of cold vodka. Down the bus, he said, now Nathaniel, I've got something very serious to talk to you about. They walked into the living room, and there spread out on the dining room table were three long photographs. 
And on the photographs was the picture of two airplanes on skis, easily read the uh, serial markings, with a dead grizzly bear being, a uh, polar bear being skinned. The Russian headlands were very visible in the background. I said, Mr. Ambassador, what's this all about? And he said, I'll tell you exactly what it's about, Nathaniel. Your guides had killed the, the polar bears off on your side of the, of, 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 the, of, of the divide between our countries. And now they're coming over onto our side, where we have stopped all polar bear hunting until the, the, the numbers recover, and they're killing our bears. And I said, Mr. Ambassador, I didn't actually dump them. Uh, the polar bear is on a no-kill list in the U.S. How the hell are they getting the polar bear skins back into the country? He said, Nathaniel, that's your job, not mine. I want you to stop the killing of my bears. There was a pause and he said, I'm serious. Somebody's going to have their ass shot off. So, I wrapped the photographs up, put them in my car, drove home, drove to the Hick Jefferson and then went back to the office at 7 o'clock in the morning and called the Chief of Enforcement of the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Director to my office immediately and uh, discussed how long this had been going on. What did we know? Who were the outfitters? Who were the guides? How did they advertise the killing of a polar bear? The ability to kill a polar bear. At about 8.15, my wonderful secretary came in and said, there are two gentlemen from the FBI who are looking forward to speaking to you. I said, ask them to come in. Um, the, two of, the two gentlemen came in and said, what were you doing in the Russian embassy last night? <laughs> and I said, I was invited by uh, uh, Ambassador De Brinin to come and take a look at some photographs of polar bears that have been shot by American gunners, flown by American pilots, handled by American outfitter, a outfitter, uh, being skinned on Russian ice. And they said, that's the most extraordinary story we've ever heard. And I said, well, that's what I was there for. Would you like to see the picture? So I had them roll, unroll. And they said, thank you very much, Mr. Sir. Did, did you know that there's a rule that if you visit the Russian embassy, you should call this following number to let the FBI in Washington know what you were doing. I said, I never heard, nobody briefed me on that one. <laughs> so I said to my secretary, isn't that extraordinary? I never heard of that. And uh, 15 minutes later, the dramatic voice of Henry Kissinger comes on the line. Not fast! What is it going on with the Russians? With polar bears? What the hell is it all about? Henry, here is the situation. <laughs> so I explained the situation. He was a, a you know, aide de camp of the president. And he said, well, this is very, very serious, and you must get a handle on it immediately and arrest all the people who are involved and stop anybody going on to Russian ice because somebody's ass might get shot off. <laughs> I said, curious that you mentioned it that way, Henry. That's exactly what Ambassador Abdul Brennan said. He said, get at it quickly and report to me. <laughs> 30 minutes later, the telephone rang, and who could it be but the Secretary of State's office? Oh, Secretary of State was Bill Rogers. The Secretary said, the Secretary of State would be pleased to see you as rapidly as possible. So I gathered up my three photographs, had a wonderful, wonderful black driver, drove me to the State Department. I was ushered in, taken upstairs to the Secretary's office, unfolded the things, explained the situation to Bill Rogers, who was a prince among men. And he said, how long is it going to take you to get in, on, on top of this? I said, I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, Mr. Secretary, I've been in office three days. I, 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 I'm not sure I even know who the head of the enforcement division of the Fish and Wildlife Service is. Uh, I don't know what my rights are, uh, are going and making a federal arrest in Alaska. I don't know how I, I, I would organize it. And he said, well, 
There'll be a meeting at the, at the Federal Bureau of Investigation's office <laughs> in two hours. <laughs> so I turned up at the FBI two hours later with representatives from the State Department and from the office of the President. And uh, the FBI came to my rescue by saying, we will come up with a, a person who is a ne'er-do-well, wealthy young man who loves to kill things. And when the outfitter checks him out, he will check, check out, complete with a bank account, a well-known bank, and he will unquestionably be able to inveigle his way into this horrible situation where we have the potential of a serious diplomatic affair. Uh, several weeks later, I met the non-entity. He looked the part, uh, talked the good line, and we put him in touch with the he, we put him in touch with the outfitter, who immediately offered him a helicopter flight into the Crow Reservation to kill a major elk, which he did. The second test was whether he would go to Southern California and shoot one of the rare desert sheep. The only thing I told him was, choose the oldest broken down ram that you can possibly see at the watering hole, which he did. And so the pièce de la résistance by the, these were, you know, ten and fifteen thousand dollar events. He was offered the opportunity to kill a polar bear for $75,000 and accepted it on the spot. Went to Alaska, was flown out on the Russian ice, killed a polar bear, marked it very carefully with black, black uh, a substance called black something, and uh, which cannot be seen by a naked eye, but can be seen by a black lamb. And we followed that bear from Alaska and lost it in Canada. And it took finding an insider at the uh, at the uh, outfitters, who was also one of the world's most famous taxidermists, three brothers, that the bear was there, the bear pelt was there. So I got a federal search warrant. I wanted to go. The secretary said that it could be really serious trouble, and I had you know, father of three children. You're not going. And anyway, they got into a secret room. There was the bear, plus, I'm sorry to tell you, a tiger, leopards, uh, jaguars, ocelots. Uh, the list was endless. Uh, made the case, and I consider it one of those most extraordinary three days of my life. Can you imagine such a thing happening on your three days? Uh, I wanted to mention that getting going with the two directors of the Fish and Wildlife Service and the director of the Park Service, both were great men, Spencer Smith at the Fish and Wildlife Service, and George Hartshaw had an <clears throat> enviable record at the National Park Service. I was 38. They were much, much older. Spencer was closing in on retirement. Um, they had had a series of assistant secretaries who were interested in photography and who traveled to refuges and national parks and really weren't very interested in environmental issues. The um, key was that uh, the prior assistant secretary by one was Dr. Stanley Kane of the University of Michigan. No finer man ever lived. Great ecologist. And he came to Washington with the National Park Advisory Board headed by Starker Leopold, who had spent three years coming up with a plan to make sure that good science was part of the management of all national parks. George didn't feel as strongly as Starker and I. Starker and I had met, but only briefly. In a one-hour meeting, our chemistry was such 
And we became blood brothers right then and there. And I, rue, I have two pictures of him in my office, and I rue the day that he died. Much too young to this day. Anyway, Starker and I determined that all superintendents acted as if they were God in their own part. And the thought of having a scientist advise them on the location or the rebuilding of a road or rehabilitation of a stream or anything else was an anathema to the superintendents. They had risen through the ranks. They had arrived at their full glory, of, especially of the 12 great national parks. Uh, so this was tough going. But while Starker and I were visiting daily uh, and Stan King, Stan dropped the bombshell on him, which was he had ordered the closing of all the garbage dumps in Yellowstone two years before, and this was the first summer where it would take full effect. This, of course, led to the confrontation with the Craighead brothers and probably produced the greatest amount of scar tissue that I've ever encountered. The uh, personal uh, attacks on me as a non-scientist who supported the decision to end the feeding of garbage to bears was as controversial as anything. The majority of the bears had been feeding on garbage most of their lives. What most people did not know is that when sows brought their cubs into the garbage dumps, the boars, the old boar males, killed at least 50% of the year's cubs. There were terrible battles between bears over who got the better pieces. While I was there, I visited Yellowstone Lake, wished I had fish, but the worst thing ever happened to me imaginable was Jack Anderson, the famous superintendent, began opening ash cans around the landing areas in the lake, at lake, lake camp, lake hotel, and the landing site. And they were filled with dead cutthroat trout. They had been caught, killed for a photograph, and then dumped. That was the beginning of my strong feeling that in a national park anyway, catch and release was going to be made mandatory. The destruction of over 130 bears caused me to cry on every occasion. It wasn't the old bears, 15, 16, 17, 18 years of age with no teeth that couldn't possibly survive without garbage. It was these young sows that had been brought up on garbage, who brought their cubs to the garbage, who all of a sudden now were asked, demanded, to go and make it in the wild. And the Craigheads very wisely said, they can't make it in the wild. They've lived on garbage all their lives. We've got to continue the garbage program until our research program is completed, and then we'll wean them off garbage. Leopold's response was classic Leopold. Once a grizzly bear tastes human garbage, it's just like a mainline shot from, of heroin. He will never forget the delightful taste of human garbage, and he will do everything in his power to get more of it. If that means breaking into a tent, occupy, breaking into an RV, occupy, going into Lake Cottage or any of the other cottages spread around the lake, we're in for a very, very tough time. But out there, in the wild, which the Craigouts will not agree to, is a population, a stable population of wild, free, roaming bears. And if we eliminate the garbage bear, on which the Craighead Research Project was completely crafted around, it was not crafted around wild bears, it was crafted around garbage dump bears. But that was hard to explain to the New York Times or the Denver Post. It was extremely, the, the Craighead brothers were uh, 
considered gods by the National Geographic Society, and it was tough. But we made it. And yesterday I happened to read in the New York Times that the count is 587 grizzly bears in all sections of Yellowstone National Park and the national forest systems that are adjacent to it. Back to Washington. The enforcement of the National Environmental Policy Act against the core of the Bureau of Reclamation to make them, and the DOT, to make them honestly state in an EIS what the downside of the preferred option was, was the battle of oil. And caused the most litigation and the most, most division between the Chief of the Corps of Engineers and the Head of the Bureau of Reclamation and myself in person. Because I would simply send their EIS over to the Justice Department and ask them whether it was sufficient. The Justice Department would send it right back saying it's not sufficient. It does not adequately address the downside of that action. And when they got one by me, they got sued by the Sierra Club or by the Wilderness Society and came back. But it was a period of intense problems between Interior, my office, and the two dam builders, channelizers, and uh, I want you to know we won a heck of a lot more. That nobody had used the Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act before we did, and we used it vigorously. We forced the court to tell us ahead of time what their plans were on the Mississippi or on the Sacramento Delta. It didn't matter where. And uh, the meetings at OMB <coughs> were close to fisticuffs, as the court maintained. We're not going to do what Secretary Reed says we're to do. And my answer was, it's not me, it's what the law says that you are going to do. And by God, you're going to do it. So those were sort of fun years. Uh, I would come home at night, not always in the best humor. Uh, the Clean Order Act was really interesting. I'll tell you one side story. As we were finishing up, the problem of nutrient pollution across the country was just beginning to be understood. We certainly did not understand it in Florida because I helped write the, the water quality rule book in Florida and I can't find any mention of nutrients. I can find all kinds of descriptions of what happens when a waste water hits native plant material. If there's a significant change in the plant material, you're polluting. We're not sure what you're polluting with, but you're polluting. Well, George Schultz, believe it or not, was the head of OMB. No finer man ever lived. And Russ Train and I met with him with the final, the final bill, which his staff had very carefully examined and said, this one's going to be tough. It takes on every sewage treatment plant, every industrial waste in the country. The industrial waste stream didn't get any kind of governmental support to get cleaned up. They could write it off their taxes, but they got no governmental support. I've told you that for a sewage treatment plant, the feds were willing to put up 90% only if the project was either finished or so far along that it was so close to be finished uh, that the local agency only had to put up 10%. It, was, it allowed us to move ahead on sewage control at a rate unforeseen in American history. The Clean Air Act was tough because of the coal fire burning big plants, some of which the Department of Interior had supported on Indian lands, Native American lands, that were sprewing all kinds of ash, acid rain all over the place. New England was actually being devastated by acid rain. Nova Scotia was, they had all of their East Coast rivers so acidified that salmon no longer, all of them were great salmon rivers, all of them were neutered. There were no living critters in those rivers. They were neutralized. The Endangered Species Act was principally written by Dr. Lee Talbot and myself and with a great deal of assistance from a series of great men on the Fish and Wildlife Service 
and from experts in the subject of endangered species that came from Yale and Harvard, Princeton, Michigan, Stanford, who came and spent a day with us, read the act carefully, 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 suggested word changes, and actually, I changed the word the night before, the night before it went to print. Um, after we got it authorized by the president to be presented to Congress, none of us really knew the full impact, I'm going to be honest with you, that the Endangered Species Act would have. E.O. Wilson has said publicly that the passage of the Endangered Species Act was the single finest piece of environmental legislation passed in the 20th century. Now let me tell you, it wasn't the easiest act on Act 1. Let me give you the first two critters where lawsuits were filed. The little snail darter on the Little Tennessee that was going to be extinguished by a dam that the senior senator of uh, Tennessee had been promised. That lawsuit went on and on, and the Congress turned against the act because they thought, we owe this dam to our good friend, the senator, who's voted the right way for all these years. And I kept saying, the little T is the most remarkable trout stream in the East. It's, it, yes, it comes out from underneath the dam, and that's why it's cool. It has the greatest amount of mayflies, of varieties of mayflies of any river in the East. It's as big as a river as uh, some of the Western rivers. It has uh, one of the great outstanding self-reproducing uh, brown trout fisheries in the East. Uh, the dam is nonsense. Uh, it's to provide second housing around a reservoir. And it was costing millions to dam up this beautiful stretch of the river. Anyway, when I thought that I had a chance, the snail darter was found in four or five creeks elsewhere in the little Tennessee Valley. And so that was gone. So within a month of that, came a permit in the de eastern desert of California for pumping several million gallons of water from the desert aquifer. That was right in the heart of where a little marvelous little fish called the desert pupfish lives in a hole, has lived there for a million years, ignored, only asking to be left alone. And now we were going to pump it dry. And somehow my Christian ethic came to the top and I said, no, we're not. We're, we're not in, in these positions to be the determiner of life and death of any critter on the face of this earth. If they go extinct on their own, they go extinct. But in the United States with the Endangered Species Act, if we can save them, by God, let's try. And so the permit was denied. And the little guys are still in their holes. And I know a lot of my congressional friends think I'm out of my mind worrying about a little critter that means nothing to them whatsoever, but has in my mind just as much right to be on the face of this earth as we do. Toward the end of my tour, or middle of my tour, Frank Richardson, the head of fisheries, came into my office and said, I've got a really superlative idea. I think we need the great battle over the preservation of wild trout in the West is at the zenith. There is an extraordinary moment where many competent biologists in the Game and Fish Commissions of the Western States are opposed to continuing stocking good old dumb hatchery fish in wild trout rivers. We can prove in many cases that the stocking of these hatchery raised fish actually displace wild fish and do more damage than good. Furthermore, here we are, we're in the new era of catch and release. Why the heck should we put dumb hatchery trout in beautiful streams that are supporting 
wild fish. And so we started with Starker Leopold joining me, we started Wild Trout One, which produced a fantastic outpouring of Trout Unlimited and the fly fishermen who came from all over the United States to talk about, in a series of symposia, the problems and the, pro the possibility of managing more rivers, not only in the Rocky Mountain West, but in the East and in the South, in the mountains of the South, and in the West as wild trout fisheries. I'll just tell you one short story. I promise to keep this short. It, the first paper was given by a young, very intelligent, very ardent fisheries biologist for Montana Game and Fish, who urged an end of stocking, especially on the Madison. He wanted to prove that there were ample numbers of wild trout in the Madison. And sitting in the front row on the right hand side were the five members of the Montana Game and Fish Commission. And they looked very dour. And I sent a note to Leopold, do you think he'll survive the night? <laughs> Not only did he survive, he continued his efforts. And many rivers now are no longer stopped. Wild Trout II was highlighted. This speech or his, this essay in which he spoke should never be lost. It was a condemnation of mismanagement by the Forest Service and the Bureau of Reclamation as regard to stream management within the National Forest within the, the boundaries of the, nest, the national lands, managed supposedly by the BLM. Cattle had knocked down the banks of the streams. Cattle manure was in the streams. The, the streams were no longer deep enough. They were shallowed out by the collapsing banks. And he gave it a rip-roaring condemnation and urged that cattle be restrained from getting to these marvelous streams by allowing them to have uh, water troughs and other, even dugout areas where the, where the stream would go in and, and stay and, 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 and literally uh, barb wire the side of the rivers. Bud Lilly and I, uh, I should just finish up by saying, the Wild Trout Symposiums continue to this day. They're, they're a significant part of management. Starker and I were very impressed with biologists and then my friendship with Bud Lilly that on private ranches there were spring creeks that were also being totally obliterated by allowing cattle to drink anywhere they wanted to. The banks had been knocked down. The river, the streams were being filled in with silt. The foliage on the side of the, of the, of the, of these wonderful spring creeks were being decimated by herds of animals. And we said, let's get out the word that a spring creek is a jewel. If it's on your land, it's a jewel. Not worthy of being broken down by cattle. And companies were formed in Montana and Colorado and uh, even Wyoming, which is, you know, <laughs> when something good happens in Wyoming, I'm ready to faint. Uh, <laughs> these companies designed stabilization of the banks, revegetating the size of the creek so that the mayflies on hatching had some place to go rather than miles of open hay. And the trout began to come back into these magnificent little jewels of spring creeks. And the ranchers began to find, quickly figure out that they could earn between 50 and 100 dollars a day from anglers who were nutty enough to want to cast over some of the most difficult trout in the West. It's been a huge success. There is a problem, of course, and that is great new wealth in America has come and bought hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres in Montana, Wyoming, elsewhere, and have closed those lands off to the general public to fish. I'm staying out of that argument. 
I, uh, I want to make sure that the maximum amount of public water remains. But I recognize the right of the landowner to spend a lot of money restoring a spring creek and enjoying it for himself or, or his friends. But if he was wise, he would set up a, a, a section of that spring creek where the general public could fish either for a fee or free, but only a certain number of them per day. Now I suppose I really ought to go back to, the, or, or, or attempt to go and discuss what I'm here for. <laughs> Very, very briefly, because <laughs> everybody in this room knows exactly what must be done if we're going to continue the great legacy of trout management in the United States. We've got to be well aware of weather change. It's changing, and all of you know that. We've got to insist upon minimum water flows. We should be very cautious on new weeds and, of course, a disease like whirling disease. There's so much at stake. I read the paper this morning that Montana had enjoyed a year last year of tourism, fishing, hunting. That was worth billions. You live, live except for today and yesterday when I landed in a snowstorm at this time of the year. You live in God's country, that's why you're here. But you're also stewards, God's stewards. We all are. We owe an enormous responsibility of what we do and how we handle ourselves in our lifetimes. Oh sure, I want a better world for my children and my grandchildren, but I feel the responsibility, even at 80 years of age, that our generation still has time to make significant changes about wildlife management, whether it be wolves or grizzly bears or caribou, moose, you name it, but above all, the great legacy of trout fishing. The, the library, named for Bud, is a collection of 10,000 books, making it one of two, maybe three libraries in the world, the best the absolute best. And every one of you in this room should be so proud of your university and your library for this great collection that continues to grow. It is a tremendous credit to the people of Montana. And I thank you for the opportunity of sharing a few old stories from an old man who remembers too many things and uh, loves to tell stories. I have enormously enjoyed your presence, and I wish you all a good night, and Godspeed. I'm just crazy enough that if anybody wants to ask me a question, I, uh, I, I'm so scarred up from years in front of testifying in front of Congress, I, I'm sure I can handle almost any one of you. Maybe one or two I can think of that might be giving me some significant trouble right now, but uh, <laughs> over lake trouting, Yellowstone Lake. But other than that, I, I can see I'm among peaceful people. Any questions? All right. Yes. Yes, good question. That was part of the, the, uh, the international discussions on, on national parks. I, chair, <laughs> I chaired that committee, and uh, the American side was absolutely, it was part of our American heritage was to fish in a national park. The Europeans did not agree, although I note that a number of national parks in Europe now allow sport fishing on a catch and release basis. Um, If you read the act and the intent of the act, if we leave it untrammeled, like the Wilderness Act, in even better condition than when we found it, then I don't see how sport fishing, under the rules of catch and release, is a tremendous deficit 
against the American concept of the national park systems. Um, I've fished for giant catfish in rivers in the national parks in East Africa without su great success. Uh, catch and release. So, no, I think I did serve one up to a, 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 a crocodile, quite a large crocodile, came and joined me and asked if I wouldn't mind sharing this large catfish that I had. And I said, Mr. Crocodile, I'll tell you what, I'm going to take 20 running steps as fast as I can go, and my catfish is your dinner with my pleasure. <laughs> Smash! That was the end of that catfish. Yes? Why do you think Republican leaders in Congress are so against the environment? Oh! <laughs> I'm a Republican in name and I'm registered uh, because my county is a solid Republican county. Um, so I like to vote in all the primaries. And I might add that a, our county beat the most hard right wing congressman uh, running for office this year. Uh, in Florida, he lost 500,000 votes in our county, enough to, for him to lose. And we uh, elected a very bright young Democrat, and he has had a most remarkable start, and it makes the Republican Party in Florida look like a bunch of dinosaurs. Only a few of them from the Dade County, Miami area have ardently supported Everglades restoration. The rest of them sit on their cans and worry about getting reelected. It's the most astonishing thing. The change in Washington is so dramatic for my day. I can't honestly give you a description more than this. In the 70s, everybody lived in Washington. Uh, they dined together. Even if they didn't like each other's points of view, they saw each other. They were polite to each other. Can you imagine that? No. The Democrats had been in charge for years, but they gave time, equal time to the Republicans. And people like John Chafee and Mac Mathias, take out 90% of what they wanted because they were respected. Scoop Jackson from Washington made it a point to give the ranking Republican on the Senate Interior Committee more than equal time. Uh, it began to slip as the Democrats, this is not very nice, as the Democrats got old in the South, and they were the party of, of segregation, and they were replaced by very conservative Republicans. And the party that I knew worked for. My mother was a state committee man, woman from Connecticut. Father worked for Dwight D. Eisenhower without halt. I don't recognize my party. I can't tell you why we've lost <coughs> the great conservation ethic that goes back to Teddy Roosevelt and even, even the worst critic of Nixon would have to agree that those years laid the fundamental basis for all environmental progress that we've made since the 70s. I can't tell you. You know, Ronald Reagan was an enchanting fellow. But, you know, when discussing the necessity of stopping upstream uh, logging on Redwoods Creek, where we had spent a fortune protecting the avenue of the tall trees, he turned to me and he said, well, doesn't one redwood tree really look like another? Uh, it's hard. Um, I spent a day with President Bush, who's a, who's a great family friend, trying to get him to sign off on the extruder, the t TED, the turtle extruder from the shrimp nets with the Republican senators from the South calling in saying we were going to put the shrimping business in the Gulf out of business if we put these trap doors on the shrimp nets to allow the shrimp to get, uh, the turtles to get out of the net and not drown. 
the new net had been designed by experts in the National Marine Fisheries Service. We had tried them for three years. We hadn't lost a turtle and hadn't lost a shrimp. The shrimp all went right to the bottom of the net. They didn't try to go out the trap door. The, the president got out his pen three times to sign the bloody thing. Three times, another senator would call in and he'd hold. And I spent the whole freaking day there into the night before he signed the order, and I went home. Uh, I don't know where the enthusiasm is, or the lack of enthusiasm, which is so disappointing. Uh, there's so many things to do. You know, I actually have been working on everybody's issue so long that I actually know what needs to be done. It's just not that complicated. It is not rocket science. What it takes is money and some new engineering. I'm afraid that the Corps' engineering at the moment is pathetic. They've lost their senior engineers. They've got a bunch of young engineers in Jacksonville who have never worked on flat land. They haven't got a clue how the system works. So we're going to be making some very definitely new proposals to the Congress to get the damn thing going again. But it's expensive. And here's a moment. Here's the moment in my life when the, set, when the Cold War is finally over. What do we do? We go attack Iraq and Afghanistan. My God, I, I've been in Afghanistan. It, 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 it's not worth it. Every life lost there is not worth it. We went to Iraq to get some oil, I think. I'm not even sure what we got. We didn't get what we wanted. We got Saddam Hussein, and that's about it. So all the money, one trillion dollars, one trillion dollars of our tax money, off budget, not, not budgeted, off budget was spent in Afghanistan and Iraq. One trillion dollars. And it's going to cost close to 500 million billion dollars to re-equip the army because so much of the equipment has been ruined by the sands of the, of the Iraq desert and the Afghan woods. Uh, and so, well, our country and our young people are in trouble because we've overspent and we don't know how to get out of the habit. And uh, we passed a very, very expensive health care bill. All of us at my age are very concerned about affordable health care, but it must be affordable for the taxpayers as well. And you can't get 10 members of the Senate to agree on anything. And so we're in the most difficult political period probably since the 1850s leading up to the Civil War, where the country was so bitterly divided. We are bitterly divided. And I don't hold out much promise that we will re reunite, because we must. Thank you for the privilege of addressing <laughs>